All right, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. So today, ooh, there we go. Before we get started, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Adina Glimcher, and I am the Senior HR Services Advisor here at Pay Entry. And as always, we are not attorneys here at Pay Entry, we are HR advisors. So if you have any questions um, for your attorney, we ask that you contact your legal team directly. Um, none of the information provided today should be um, construed as legal advice. And if you have any questions at all about the content of the training, you can always contact us at hrservices at payentry.com. And we ask that you do submit your questions to that email address for the topic today if they are unique to your company. So if you're um, doing a certain thing within your interviewing process or asking a certain question and you want us to kind of review that for compliance, please ask those specific questions to um, our email address and we will get back to you individually. And if you have any general questions, you can of course go ahead and put them into the question box on um, your little tab and we will go ahead and um, answer those at the end during our Q&A session. All righty. So why are we here today? Today we're going to be talking about the do's and don'ts of interviewing. So we're going to go through our ag agenda first and foremost. We're going to discuss the importance of an effective interview process. We're going to discuss a recruitment strategy and why it's important to have one. We're going to talk about reviewing resumes and applications and best practices associated with those. We're going to discuss the interview process, pre-employment tests, references and background checks, job offers, and record keeping. And then we're going to go at the end of our presentation through some hiring statistics of 2022, and we will end with a Q&A session as well. And I did get a little feedback in the question box that you all are having a hard time hearing me. So if that continues, please let me know. I'm doing my best to move a little closer to the mic. All right, so we're going to try something new out this week. We want to try and engage our audience. So we're going to go ahead and try a poll. We're going to put a question on the screen and we're going to go ahead and share a poll with everybody and ask for your participation. If for whatever reason you're not able to participate in the poll, you can feel free to put your answer into the question box and I'll be able to see your answers that way as well. All right, so the first one. The perfect employee really does exist. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? Oh, I am getting a variety of answers. Thank you everybody for participating. All right, let's give it a few more seconds. Go ahead and get your answers in. All right, and I'm going to close the poll. All right, so 32% of you believe that the perfect employee does not, or does exist, excuse me, and then 68% of you think it's a myth. Well, it is a myth. It is not necessarily about finding the perfect candidate. It is about finding the right person for the job. If you're holding out for the candidate of your dreams, you may be waiting a very long time. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Interviews uncover important job-related information beyond what is provided in the candidate's resume. Right, give me one moment to launch that. All right, and go ahead and let me know, do you think that is a fact or a myth? All right, seems like almost everyone's on the same page with this one. I'll give you just a few more seconds. All right, so the majority of you say this is a fact and indeed you are correct so interviews really give you an opportunity to learn more about your candidates which is why we always recommend doing them 
um, rather than just simply looking at a resume and making your hiring decision based off of that. All right, just a couple more and then we'll get back into um, our regular presentation. If you make a verbal offer to a candidate, there is no need for a written offer letter. Go ahead and Mark, do you think this is a fact or a myth? All right, I'm seeing a little bit of a variety on this one too, so I'm very happy everybody's here listening to this presentation today. All right going to go ahead and close it and let's look at the results. So most of you think this is a myth, although we do have a few who, who believe it's a fact. And the truth is, it is a myth. So although you can make a verbal offer to a candidate, it is best practice to always follow up with a formal written offer that clearly lists any contingencies that could lead to withdrawal of the offer. Right. And I know I already said the answer, there it is. We're gonna do just one more. Reasonable accommodations for applicants with the disability start during the hiring process and not after they are hired. All right, do you think this is a myth or a fact? Oh, we have quite the variety here. Oh, it keeps changing. <laughs> Get your answers in and I'll show you the results. All right, a few more seconds. All right. So 77% 77, 77 of you believe this is a fact that the reasonable accommodations for applicants with a disability start during the hiring process, not after. And 23% of you think it is a myth. Well, it is a fact. Under the ADA or the Americans with Disability Act and similar state laws, applicants with disabilities may require a reasonable accommodation in order to apply for the job and have an equal opportunity to be considered for the job. So thank you all so much for your participation. We really appreciate that. And it gives us a good idea of kind of where everyone's at with their knowledge prior to beginning. All right, so next we're going to be talking about the importance of effective interview processes. So you can see the highlighted terms here are um, what an effective interview process can lead to. So it can lead to better hires, reducing hiring costs, improve retention, and minimizing your legal risk. Let's dig into each one of those. Make better hires. So having an effective interview process enables an employer to determine if an applicant's skills, experience, and personality meet the job requirements. It identifies the most qualified candidate, which will ultimately help save you some money, reduce your hiring costs. Financial success improves when you hire the best employees. So if you're recruiting less, your recruitment costs are gonna go down, as well as your selection costs and your productivity and disruption costs. And then having an effective interview process will also improve retention because an employee's experience begins at the very beginning. So it will create a good candidate experience and bring in talent that aligns well with your company culture, which ultimately will cause people to stay. And then it will minimize your legal risk. So having a consistent approach will lead to a fair process, which will oftentimes prevent discrimination, negligent hiring, sexual harassment, and unintentional contracts. So it's important that um, not only do you have an effective interview process, but that you're also following your local and federal laws regarding ban the box requirements, salary history bans, et cetera. So what is the recruitment strategy? The recruitment strategy is a plan with steps to find, recruit, hire, and retain employees. The strategy usually reflects company values and goals. So first we're going to talk about goals. Goals are often, you know, what, how many people do you want to hire? Do you want to hire more diverse people? Um, maybe you want to change your hiring process. So really establishing those goals is the, the first part of your recruitment strategy. Next is positions. So how many employees do you want to hire? What positions do you want to hire for? 
um, and consider if any of your employees are leaving soon or if your department or team could benefit from the skills a new employee can provide. So maybe doing some succession planning. What's your timeline? Which positions do you need to fill first or quickly? Which positions can you maybe wait a little while to fill? Of course, budget is always important in any strategy. What are your recruiting costs, which often can include marketing? Make sure you take into consideration your budget for expenses later on in the process as well, including for background checks or maybe some other pre-employment test. Um, determine your target audience. So if your position requires knowledge of a certain area, you may want to advertise that job in that area. Develop a marketing plan. And you may think this kind of falls under a different um, different category, and it often can, but it does align within your with your recruitment strategy. So think about the kinds of advertising open to you and what best fits your needs. How are you going to market these positions to your potential candidates? And then selection process, of course, determine how you will select your candidate, which is a key part of your recruitment strategy. So the topic of our webinar today is do's and don'ts. So we're gonna get into some do's and don'ts of creating a recruitment strategy. So do, make sure you identify your hiring needs. Make sure you understand the essential functions, requirements, and expectations of the role. Understand the skill set, expertise, and experience that the candidate needs in order to do the job successfully. And create a job description that clearly defines the job title, overview, responsibilities, and required skills. If you don't have any of these in place or you need help developing them, our team can absolutely help you. So definitely reach out if you, if you would like some assistance with those. Now, what are some things you should not do when creating a recruitment strategy? Well, don't overextend your organization's abilities. So it often happens that people assume that their employees performing extremely well can take on more things and still perform extremely well. Well, we're all human and there's only so much we can do. So don't always assume that your current employees are going to take on the additional work and do so successfully. Make sure you don't rush into the hiring process. This is something I see time and time again, is there is a immediate need for a position. And so without really taking the proper step, um, you know, a company will just decide to post a job really quick and start getting candidates in. And that can open you up to some risk and, and potentially getting some candidates who are not a good fit. So it's important to take your time with the process. Overlook harmless statements. So what do we mean by that? So if you're looking for uh, a candidate and you put something in your job ad that says seeking young and dynamic um, uh, employees or people or looking for a handyman to help me with X, Y, and Z, um, those often not only do they uh, generally cause a certain gender potentially, if you're using the word like handyman to apply, but it also can be some kind of age discrimination. If you're seeking a young and dynamic candidate, does that exclude some of our older candidates? Or if you're seeking a mature person, does that exclude some of our younger people? Um, so just, it's important that these statements that you don't mean any negativity by are inclusive of all kinds of people. So once again, it's important that you're having your HR team or your um, managers look into these and having multiple eyes on them prior to posting. And don't forget the legal requirements of job descriptions and job postings. You may be wondering what, what legal requirements are you talking about? Well, there are pay transparency laws in some states, um, and then some states require that there's an EEO statement or at will statement on some of these items. So it's important that you are aware of your legal requirements. One thing I did forget to mention at the beginning of the presentation is as always, these slides are located in the handout section. So if you would like to follow along via those or print those out for um, your reference after the presentation, feel free to do so. So reviewing resumes and applications. What do we look for when screening applicants? So we wanna look for their work history descriptions, skills and qualifications, job changes, work history gaps, promotions and award, awards, evidence of being a team player, evidence of taking initiative, 
and then some red red flags as well. So examples of red flags can include somebody who's maybe overly qualified or demonstrates a lack of growth um, through their their resume or their application. Maybe someone who has a lot of misspelled words or other mistakes that show that they don't have great attention to detail or maybe don't care very much about um, you know uh, editing their document prior to sending it to you or maybe they don't follow directions on your application. It's important not to have bias when looking at each of these categories. We're all human and things do happen. Work history gaps do occur. Job changes do occur. So don't just make assumptions based on any of these items. Definitely give your candidates the benefit of the doubt and have a conversation with them and ask them questions if you have concerns about anything you see on the resume or the application. Which brings us into the do's and don'ts of reviewing resumes. So make sure that you categorize your resumes. It can get very overwhelming if you have a lot of people applying for your job, which hopefully we all do. So maybe put different um, stacks or different uh, categories. So have a stack of people who really fit the job requirements very well or the job description uh, based on their experience. Have a stack of those who you might consider and then those who don't meet the qualifications. Make sure that you respond to all job applicants, even those who do not qualify. Um, no one likes to apply for a job and never hear back either way. So make sure you do let them know if you've chosen to go with a different candidate. Make sure you ignore the applicant's name. That might sound a little silly, but we don't want any subconscious bias to occur. So we're not really focused on their name, their address, or their personal information. We're focused on whether or not they have the experience or the education to do the job. And then use an applicant tracking system. If that's something that you're able to do, that will often help with the subconscious bias. Things to avoid. So don't make assumptions instead of discussing them with the applicant. As I said, if you have concerns, discuss them with the applicant and get some answers. Don't disqualify someone based on superficial issues, such as the style font or length of resume. We all kind of have our own thoughts on this. So someone's a great candidate and their resume is greater than one page or greater than two pages, don't necessarily disqualify them just because of that. Don't research an applicant's personal social media platform. We wanna to stick to the professional um, options when it comes to this, including background checks and reference checks. And then don't narrow down applications based on your personal feelings or opinion. So it's important that we're doing our best to treat everyone equally. So the next step is setting up the interview. We got a great candidate to apply and it's time to set up an interview. Some dues, um, conduct a phone interview or a phone screen to confirm the basic requirements and give the applicant more information on the position. This will probably save you a lot of time because through this phone screen, you'll find out a good amount of information on the candidate. They'll find out a good amount about you as the employer, and you can determine whether you want to move forward with an in-person or virtual interview. Uh, make sure that you're using an email template to schedule interviews for professional reasons and consistency reasons, and plan the place and the time for the interview. What should you not do? Don't choose the wrong interviewer. So what do we mean by this? Well, maybe you work for a large retailer and you need a uh, a team member for your logistics team but your logistics manager is out of the office so you have your clothing manager come and, and interview your logistics candidate well chances are they're not going to bring about the best team member for your team or hire the best team member because they're not familiar with your team and your team's culture and need so make sure that you are choosing the right person to interview um, depending on what job you're hiring for. And maybe that's just your HR person. Maybe they have a good idea of what you're looking for, but make sure that you're not just throwing someone in the fire. Don't rush the interview. Take your time, schedule enough time before and after the interview. Things don't always run on time as we know. And don't be unprepared. Give them the benefit of the doubt, have read their resume and have questions prepared. So how do we prepare for an interview? Use an interview guide to structure the way interviews are conducted. Once again, we want to make sure that we are consistent. 
make sure you're using standardized questions for each job. So have a set of questions already prepared. Don't just think of them on the fly. Take notes as you go. Prepare a standardized sheet with room for answers. Have multiple people interview the candidate. The idea is to get a clear picture while reducing bias. Know your candidate. What do we mean? Review their resume or their cover letter directly before the interview. So it can be very overwhelming when you're interviewing a lot of people. I know we've all done it before. And you may, you know, kind of forget who's coming next or who your three o'clock is. But give them the benefit of the doubt and take the time to review their resume and come in knowing their name and you know a little bit about their experience. Choose an appropriate office or place designated for the interview. So it's never fun to conduct an interview in the middle of your sales floor or you know with your customers present. Ensure privacy to avoid distractions, but make sure that there are others around to make certain that all parties are comfortable in the environment and understand your organization and be ready to answer questions. We all know that many interviewees per come prepared with questions, so make sure that you're the right person to answer them, or make sure that you can get back to them fairly quickly with the answers to their questions. All right, so we're gonna um, move on to my favorite part of the presentation, what questions to avoid. So we have taken um, a few different categories and given you do's, don'ts, or yes or no's, however you want to word it as to questions to ask and which questions to avoid. So when it comes to marital and family status, you may want to know, can you work the specified work schedule? That is okay to ask. What's not okay to ask? It's who's responsible for your children's childcare, or do you plan to have children? We want to stay away from those. National origin and citizenship. You can ask somebody, are you authorized to work in the United States? Or can you provide proof of eligibility to work in the United States? But you should not ask them where they were born or where their accent's from or how long ago they moved here or anything of that sort. Regarding disabilities, you can ask your candidates, will you need a reasonable accommodation to perform the essential functions of the job? But you should not ask people if they have a disability or if they've ever filed a workers' compensation claim. Moving on, arrests and convictions. Generally, this category is off limits as most states at this point do not allow you to ask this um, on applications or during the interview process. But if this does come up, evaluate how specific the criminal conduct relates to the job. So, you know, if the criminal conduct has something to do with minors and you are hiring for a teacher, that may directly correlate. So definitely consider that. Um, and don't ask, have you ever been arrested or convicted of a crime, as that can be against the law in your state. When it comes to religion, you can ask, can you meet the schedule requirements and can you comply with the dress code policy? But you should never ask, you know, do you wear that headscarf or that hat for religious reasons? Or do you go to church on Sundays? I often hear um, companies ask their employees, oh, well, you know, do you go to church or do you, you know, go to synagogue on the weekend because it's really important that you're working for us those days? You want to avoid those questions to avoid any religious discrimination. And then COVID-19. So wait until after a conditional offer has been extended to inquire about vaccination status and make sure that when you do inquire about vaccination status that you are providing exemption, exemptions excuse me, for medical and religious reasons. And the reason for this is some states actually prohibit employers from requiring employees to be vaccinated. So it's important that we're not discriminated against discriminating against anybody because of their vaccination status. So don't ask your candidates, are you vaccinated against COVID-19? And then don't follow up with why or why not. That's none of our business. We don't need to know that. When it comes to military obligations, um, you can inquire about relevant job-related skills acquired during their service but you should not ask a candidate if they have any military obligations that would require them to miss work. For pay history, you should absolutely provide candidates with the starting salary or the salary range if required in your state or requested by the candidate, but you should never ask the candidate how much they earned in a previous role against the law in many states. 
And then lawful activity um, off duty. So you can commute your drug, communicate your drug and alcohol policy to your candidates, and you can even communicate pre-employment um, testing requirements if that's something you do. Of course, you should be consistent, but you should never ask a candidate if they smoke, drink alcohol, or use marijuana. All right, so I could foresee some questions coming about on the slides we've reviewed so far. So if you have questions that are, um, you know, kind of general questions, feel free to put them in the the chat. Otherwise, um, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Otherwise, you can always email us your questions. So we wanted to go through some common interviewer bias. Um, I think bias often occur, often occurs in the interview process um, without us even knowing, right? So stereotyping might happen. This is when you judge someone based on their group rather than their individual characteristics. This can happen the moment they walk through your door. Maybe they look a certain way or walk a certain way and you're immediately starting to stereotype. Inconsistency in questions. So instead of asking each candidate the same or similar questions, you adjust your questions to the candidate. So we do want to avoid this. There may be one or two things on their resume you want to ask about that's unique to them and that's generally okay but your core questions they should be the same for all your candidates at least for the same position the first impression bias most interview decisions are actually decided by judgments made within the first five seconds halo effect so that's when you focus on one positive trait and erase the perception of their less attractive one and the horn effect is the exact opposite. So you let one bad impression or one bad, bad trait overshadow the positive. Next is cultural noise. So a communication barrier created from the wrong explanation of another person's behavior um, is cultural noise. So an example of this is Nonverbal communication cues such as posture, gesture, or maybe even how close someone is standing to you, um, that is different amongst different cultures and in societies, what the norm is. So oftentimes these nonverbal behaviors can create conflicting messages in communication. Um, that's called cultural noise. So that could be a bias if someone's maybe standing a little too close to you or a little too far away, um, and you make your decision based on that or any other example. Nonverbal bias is judging candidates based on body language rather than skills. The contrast effect is if the candidate was weak, does the second look extra strong? So comparing candidates to each other rather than to a standard. The similar to me bias, unfortunately, I think this is a very, very common one. Um, it's when you feel strongly about a candidate because you have a lot in common. I think we we all as humans get very excited when we learn that someone shares a common interest or something in common with us, um, but that should not be the reason you hire somebody. And then central tendency. You find fault with everyone and keep looking for that elusive purple unicorn. So you're looking for that perfect candidate. All right, be a good interviewer. So open on a positive note during your interview, make it conversational. So allow them to ask questions, avoid distractions. I don't know if any of you have ever been in an interview when you can identify immediately the person is actually not interested in you for the job and it does not feel great. Um, so make sure you're giving them the same respect that they're giving you by coming in and interviewing for the position. I already mentioned this, but give them a chance to ask questions. Take your time, avoid making any promises, explain the next steps, close the interview graciously, and follow up with them either way as soon as possible. Pre-employment tests. So make sure that you are using the tests as intended, that you take the test yourself to make sure that it's one, what you wanna be asking people, two, it's realistic, and three, that it's a fair and, and reputable test. And test for data that is important to the job. Don't just test for random, random things. The don'ts. Don't test inconsistently. So don't pick and choose who you're going to provide a test to. Don't ignore the results because you like the candidate who didn't test well. 
And I want to pause here from, for a moment because this sounds awfully similar to what we always say about handbooks as HR professionals. If you're going to have a handbook, you have to follow the handbook. If you're going to have a pre employment test, you should follow your pre employment test, meaning you should use it as a reason to decide who to hire. If someone is really awesome and they don't do well on your test, they should not be um, considered for the position. So if you're gonna have one, make sure you're actually using it to help make those hiring decisions. And don't use flawed tests or create your own assessment. Make sure you're getting one from a reputable site or a reputable source. Next, we wanna dig into the do's and don'ts of reference and background checks. And I do see a couple questions coming in, so great. Um, go ahead and keep sending those in. And if we don't have time at the end of the presentation, we will we'll email you directly with the answers. Um, Otherwise, we'll answer them at the end. Keep them coming. Reference and background checks. So do get consistent, excuse me, get consent and authorization prior to screening. Use a professional agency to process the background check. Don't use your buddy who has whitepages.com on their phone. Make sure you're using professionals. Know what kind of checks should be done. Take adverse action as required by the FCRA and make sure you are providing required notices and communication to candidates. Don't use social media and online searches. Don't immediately reject a candidate because they don't have a quote unquote clean record. Make sure you don't fail to communicate when you find something on a background check and don't neglect your ban the box law and other applicable laws. So once you decide to put in uh, or to provide a job offer, as we've talked about, make sure that you put it in writing. It should include the job title, supervisor, location, work hours, starting pay, summary of benefits, conditional nature of the offer, and any contingencies in an at-will statement as well, if that is applicable in your state. Make sure you allow reasonable time for the candidate to consider the offer and ask the candidate to sign and return the letter by a predetermined date if they choose to accept. Don't constitute the offer as an employment contract. Don't surprise the candidate, meaning don't just throw out a, a number you haven't talked about or a position you haven't talked about. Make sure that you're both on the same page and make sure you're not listing their salary in annual terms if they, their pay differs based on hours work. So if they're a non-exempt hourly employee, make sure that you're listing that hourly amount as the amount of hours they work may differ and therefore their annual salary may differ or annual compensation, I should say, excuse me. When it comes to record keeping, all records relating to the hiring process must be kept for a specific period of time. This is generally designated by your state. Um, and if there is an investigation, records must be ranked retain until the investigation is completed. And then some pre-employment documents include job descriptions, position requisitions, employment applications and resumes, evaluations, assessment results, background and reference results, and offer letters. All right, so I just provided you with a ton of information. And before we end our presentation today, we wanted to provide you with some fun statistics. So according to LinkedIn's top 100 statistics of 2022, nearly four in five candidates say the overall candidate experience they receive is an indicator of how a company values its people. So take time and show your, your candidates that you value them. Companies with the well-designed onboarding process experience 50% greater new hire retention, which is huge. We're all trying to figure out how we can keep our employees and keep them happy. 80% of candidates who experience an unsatisfactory recruitment process reveal that they openly tell people about their experience, and a third of these candidates will do so proactively. Organizations that invest in a strong candidate experience improve the quality of their new hires by 70%. The average cost of a bad hire is 30% of that hire's annual salary. So it's gonna cost you money if you don't take the time, um, the appropriate time to hire candidates that are good fits for the position. And bad hires can result in a 32% drop in employee morale and 36% drop in productivity. 
And when we say bad, bad hires, we mean that they're just not a good fit for the job. All right, so let's test your knowledge a little bit. Let's say you're interviewing for a sales position that involves a lot of overnight travel. You need someone who can put in long hours and be away from home for extended periods of time. Which of the following questions is appropriate? A, are you married? B, how many children do you have? C, do you have any personal commitments that would prevent you from traveling for several days at a time? Or D, does your religion prohibit you from working on Sundays? So you can go ahead and just think which one is correct or type your uh, answer into the question box, whatever works best for you. All right, I'm seeing some come in. Thank you for your participation. And it looks like we're all on the same page. C, do you have any personal commitments that would prevent you from traveling for several days at a time? That is the appropriate question. Next. You're interviewing candidates for a customer service position in an area where many languages other than English are commonly spoken. You're looking to hire someone who can communicate effectively in both English and Spanish. Which of the following questions is appropriate? Is it A, are you Mexican or Cuban? B, what languages do you speak and write fluently? C, what is your native language? Or D, where did you learn to speak Spanish? All right, I see some answers coming in. Thank you, thank you. And once again, it looks like we are all on the same page. What languages do you speak and write fluently is the appropriate question to ask. Oh, this one's all popped up at the same time. All right, one last one. Federal law makes it illegal to knowingly hire an unauthorized individual and employers must verify and document all new hires eligibility to work in the U.S. Which of the following questions is appropriate? Are you a U.S. citizen? Were you born in the U.S.? Do you have a U.S. passport or are you authorized to work in the U.S.? All right. You all got it. It is D. Are you authorized to work in the U.S.? All right, thank you everybody so much for your participation today. We really do appreciate you joining us for our bi-weekly webinar. Make sure you join us again in two weeks. Uh, actually, I think we're doing Tuesday. We'll, we'll definitely send an invite out to everybody and we'll answer a couple questions. So we have a question. If the state we are operating in does not prohibit asking about COVID vaccination statuses, why would we wait until after a conditional offer was made? Isn't it a waste of time? Well, that's a really great question. And the reason I would say you would still want to wait is you don't want to hire or not hire somebody because of their vaccination status, as that would be construed as discrimination. Um, so it's best to wait so that there's no claims of discrimination based on, on that reason. If it is a condition of employment that they're vaccinated, then you're likely going to offer them a um, exemption because medical or religious reasons anyway. So that's why I would recommend waiting. Um, why can you not ask about smoking? Are smokers a protected class? Well, generally, we don't want to ask um, employees about their behavior outside of work if there's no, you know, legality or reason to do so because that's their personal life. Um, if you're speaking about marijuana specifically, um, their marijuana can be or the use of marijuana can be a protected class um, if it's used for medical reasons. So we get into a lot of gray areas when we start asking questions about what people are doing outside of the workplace, which is why we don't generally recommend that you ask those questions. All right, well, that's all we're gonna go through right now. I think that's all the questions that were submitted. Any additional questions, please make sure that you send them to us at hrservices at payentry.com. And thank you again for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.